1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So this is the basis for our church, one God, one church, not 35,000. And we welcome you, and if this is your first time here, thank you so much for joining us, and please thank the person for us that referred you. And uh, we just want to let you know that we are um, a church that's online at the moment only. We don't have a place of worship, but we, uh, we have a service twice a month, and in that service we follow the Catholic Mass format, and we do that because it is the earliest church format. If you go back to church history, there was a guy in a program not long ago that said, if you really research the early church fathers, so the ones who immediately followed the apostles and what they did and passed on, you have to follow the Catholic faith. And we're not saying the Catholic Church, but the Catholic faith, faith, the mass format, and so many other things that they believed in. So, and hopefully we're going to touch on a little bit about that, those things today, all right? And so, um, just want to again say welcome, and like I said, a Catholic mass format. So we do celebrate communion or the Eucharist, the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And um, we ask you to believe and take it seriously. That is his body and blood entering you during communion, okay? And not so long ago we had a section on this, the chaplet of the Divine Mercy from St. Faustina, and so Jesus, I trust in you, and we hope you do too, all right? It's the hardest thing in the world, complete trust, isn't it? Okay, so hope that covers everything. I guess I should say somewhere in here, right, I have the, sh the spiel. So we are at... <laughs> If you're finding this just online because someone forwarded it to you, www.og-oc.com. That's www.og-oc.com. Our phone number, if you want to call for prayer or anything or comments, 800-428-8058. Again, 800-428-8058. What you'll notice, um, if, you go, if you listen to our services, we don't ask for money. God's word should be free, and but we also believe that if you feel you're being helped and have the wherewithal and would like to contribute financially, if you go to our website, we do have a donate pay, um, button. But we're not begging you every week or every month or every six months, please send us money. All right? The word of God should be free. You should find a way, if you truly love him, to get it out there. Okay, because we're all called to be missionaries. We all can't be asking for money. Alrighty. Okay, so with that, we'll start with an opening prayer. Okay. And that is, uh, because we follow the Catholic format, we bless ourselves. We uh, show reverence to God. Alright. And that's why I wear a tie because he deserves the reverence. Okay, so we'll bow our heads and pray. All right. So Heavenly Father, speak to us that we may become makers of your peace in our homes, in our communities, and in our world. May we become one body under your authority. And we pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so now we're We'll go to our, our reading section, but before we start that, I'm going to say a little something. All right, so you probably know, if you're receiving this, that my dad, Vic, passed away on February 26th. And his passing, coming so soon after my brother Jake's passing on November 4th, it's really been tough. It really has. I mean, I really haven't...
focused on preparing anything. Um, I, I've been just doing a lot of praying with Karen. We've been praying for our family and friends, for strength and courage. We pray for the souls of those who have departed us, not just Dad and Jake, but uh, my mom and Karen's mom and dad, our grandparents and others. And um, so we haven't, I just truthfully haven't felt like doing this, even though I know I should, all right? I haven't even gotten a haircut, which I'm long overdue on. So what we're going to do is we're going to prepare, uh, we're actually going to, be, hopefully it'll be pretty seamless, but today, on Sunday the uh, 14th, we're going to prepare two services, and we'll post them appropriately, appropriately one today and one in um, a week or two, so they both get in for the month. The reason we're doing this is just because we'll be traveling to Southern California for my dad's affairs, and then actually, too, there's a service included for Jake there at the church, Holy Family Catholic Church in Orange, California. Um, so the good part is you don't have to listen to me in my monotone droning voice. You'll get to have some two special guests, as we call it, okay? And they're, uh, the first one that you'll see will be Father Joseph, all right? And the second one, Father John Paul. They're both from EWTN. We highly recommend that you look it up on your cable guide and start watching programs. I've said it before, I dare you to watch it for two weeks and see if, if you don't have a changed heart. Just the reason I, we chose these two is Karen and I truly admire their humility and you'll see it in both of them in a little bit of different way, right? And how refreshing it is to see someone speaking with humility and a humble heart, right? Compared to what you see when you go out in the world and go to a different church or watch a Christian evangelist on TV, they're always trying to make gestures and everything and tug at your heart and all kinds of things when really God wants us to all be humbled, especially before him. So uh, both sermons are excellent. I don't think you'll be bored with either one and they will both get you thinking, that is, if you let them. So this is Lent, so both are Lent appropriate. And what I mean by that is both of them should get you thinking and get you to examine your heart and yourself and start thinking about being closer and in a closer relationship with God the Father, Son, and spirit, okay? So Father Joseph speaks on the same scriptures we'll read today, and um, well, we're going to read both, but um, just a little bit about the Father Joseph sermon. He incorporates Babe Ruth into his, and you probably didn't know Babe Ruth was a Catholic. A while back during the Super Bowl, I think we did Super Bowl champions, and it was Vince Lombardi, I believe, and if few others, and um, it's amazing how many people in sports embrace the Catholic faith. So it'll be very interesting, and I, I know you'll enjoy it. During the homily for the second service, Father John Paul talks about loving God and loving people. And he rightly says, you cannot love God without knowing him. You can't love anybody without knowing them. So to know God, you must pray to him, you must talk to him, you must listen to him. And that's the big part. We go on and on and on, but do we stop and have those quiet moments and ask God, what are you telling me? And listen, all right? What do you want me to do, Lord? Okay? So, Karen and I hope you'll take the time to watch both of these, maybe over and over again, and listen to them. And, uh, Again, we just ask because we're not a big budget church. So we just ask that you just pass it on and us on to everyone you know. Send it to them. They don't have to. If they don't like it, okay. But at least you uh, 
gave it a shot, right? So, now we'll start the readings. Our first reading comes from the book of Hosea, chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Come, let us return to the Lord. It is He who has rent, but He will heal us. He has struck us, but He will bind our wounds. He will revive us after two days. On the third day, He will raise us up to live in His presence. Let us know, let us strive to know the Lord. As certain as the dawn is his, is his coming, and his judgment shines forth like the light of day. He will come to us like the rain, like spring rain that waters the earth. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your piety is like a morning cloud, like the dew that early passes away. For this reason, I smote them through the prophets. I slew them by the words of my mouth, for it is love that I desire, not sacrifice, and knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And today we will again have a second reading, and it is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 51, verses 3 to 4 and 18 to 19. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness. In the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt, and of my sin cleanse me. For you are not pleased with sacrifices. Should I offer a burnt offering, you would not accept it. My sacrifice, O God, is a contrite spirit. A heart contrite and humble, O God, you will not spurn kind of go together, don't they? And again, I say this every week in reverence to our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, that part of every Mass or worship should contain the words of Jesus Christ in one of the four Gospels. And of course, before reading it, we announce the good news because He did, called it the good news. We say, Alleluia, uh, in reverence to Him, we say, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. And in this case, the Gospel of the Lord according to St. Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. And in response, we make the sign, we say, Glory to you, O Lord, <clears throat> and we make the sign of the cross on our foreheads, on our lips, and on our hearts. And I will always try to remember to do that every time we have a service, because Jesus' words should truly be on our minds, always on our lips first, and of course, right here in our hearts, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Jesus addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness and despised everyone else. Two people went up to the temple area to pray. <clears throat> One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee took up his position and spoke this prayer to himself, O oh God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of humanity, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I pay my tithes on my whole income. But the tax collector, collector stood off at a distance and would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and prayed, O oh God, be merciful to me. A sinner. I tell you, the latter went home justified, not the former. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So think about that and just listen to um, Father John Paul. He's got a great homily on this, so just take it away, Father John Paul. For it is love that I desire, not sacrifice, knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. 
God desires our love. God also desires that we know him. And we cannot love someone that we do not know. So knowledge of God precedes love of God. The more we know about God, the more we come to love God and the God who has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, love himself. The psalm response takes us a step further. It is mercy I desire, not sacrifice. God who is mercy desires us to be merciful. The sheer fact that God the Son took on human flesh for our salvation is an act of God's mercy for us. It's the greatest act of God's mercy, that God has become man, that the eternal Son, the Logos, has assumed human nature in all things but sin. That's sheer mercy. And he desires us to participate in that act of mercy. We can walk through the entire canon of sacred scripture and see a merciful God. In the incarnation, God wanted us to show, wanted to show us the depths of his love and mercy, that he loves with a human heart, a heart full of love and compassion. St. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, God is rich in mercy. Dives in misericordia. One of the titles of Pope St. John Paul II's encyclicals that he would write in the 1980s. Perhaps in our case, we can look at this as a steady progression. Knowledge leads to love which leads to mercy. Knowledge leads to love, which in turn leads to mercy, which leads to God's heart up against our heart. We cannot be merciful ourselves unless we have first received mercy. God desires us to be merciful but only after we have received his mercy. We cannot give what we do not possess. In the old Latin axiom, nemo dat quo non habit. You cannot give what you do not possess. If I myself do not possess or have not encountered the mercy of God, how do I expect to give it what I have not encounter what I do not possess. We can't. We are merely beggars before the beggar who is Christ. That is, we who are small be beggars, beggars before God, before Christ who is the capital B, beggar, who begs for our love. The gospel shows us what a real relationship with God demands. The parable contrasts two very different dispositions before God in prayer. The Pharisee's prayer was simply external and he exalted himself at the expense of his neighbor. Rather than humbling himself before God, and begging his assistance and mercy, the Pharisee praised himself. He was full of pride and self-centered. The tax collector, on the other hand, humbled himself before God and begged for God's assistance and mercy. We see in a tax collector a man contrite and soaring for his sins. And his simple prayer affirms this, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's our disposition 
before God. O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What a clear contrast to the prideful and selfish prayer of the Pharisee. O oh God, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of humanity, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. What a sheer contrast of dispositions that we can possibly have before God. The Pharisee was not praying, but he was praising himself, not praising God. Praying is elevating one's soul to God so that God might expand it, expand our capacity, expand our soul. God heard the tax collector's prayer because he was sorry for his sins. His cry for help showed his humility in contrast to the pride of the Pharisee. One clear message we can take away from this parable is that our external actions must conform to our interior disposition. What's going on in the inside of our soul? in the inside of our heart has to conform to our external actions, even to our words. In other words, when I place myself before God, am I truly sorry and repentant of my sins? This is something that St. Teresa of Avila would reiterate constantly in her writings, in her teachings to her sisters that when one comes before the Almighty, the majesty of God, are we sorry, are we contrite for our sins? Do we open up our hearts to God in mercy before we even give him an act of adoration, an act of praise, thanksgiving, petition? And am I aware of my absolute need and dependence of the Almighty God? That my whole life depends on God. God is existence itself. We are merely contingent beings. Our entire existence hangs on God's existence, relies on God's existence. There is no room for pride in our relationship with the Lord. Our relationship has to be grounded in humility. And this is the great struggle of the Christian life, isn't it? Growth in humility. To be grounded in humility. Another message we can take away is only the humble can be merciful. Not the prideful. Mercy is shown to those, to those who recognize how little they are before God. How small we are before God. That we recognize that God is the creator and that we are the creature. And that without the creator, we simply would vanish. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI wrote, Mercy is in reality the core of the gospel message. It is the name of God himself, the face with which he revealed himself in the Old Testament and fully in Jesus Christ, incarnate of creative and redemptive love. This love of mercy also illuminates the face of the church, he says, and is manifest in the sacraments, in particular that of the sacrament of penance and reconciliation, as well as in the works of charity, both of community and individuals. Everything that the church says and does shows that God has mercy for man. Everything that the church says and does says that God has mercy for man. 
most especially in the inner workings of the sacraments. How God wants to bestow his union, his intimacy, his love, his sincerity of heart, his open wounded side for us sinners. Pope St. John Paul II said, those who sincerely say, Jesus, I trust in you, will find comfort in all their anxieties and fears. Don't we need to hear a message like that? Coming up on one year since the lockdowns in not just the United States, but throughout the world. Many people still have that kind of anxiety and fear. That's a message that we need to hear. Jesus, I trust in you. To say that over and over again to the Lord. Again, not to yourself, but to him. To him who wants to hear from you. Pope St. John Paul II continues, there is nothing more that man needs than divine mercy. That love which is benevolent, which is compassionate, which raises man above his weakness to the infinite heights and holiness of God. The publican in the parable begged for God's mercy. The tax collector begged and he received from God what he begged for. The Pharisee did not beg for God's mercy. His prayer was to himself, and it was nothing but praise and flattery. This was not pleasing to God. It's never pleasing to God. The Pharisee walked away condemned, and the publican, the tax collector, walked away justified. He walked away in grace, in God's friendship. The parable shows us that when we pray, we should have a deep desire to deepen our friendship with God. That's our primary disposition when we come before the Lord in prayer, any type of prayer, to deepen our relationship with God. In prayer, our primary disposition, again, is to be like a beggar, a lowercase b, beggar, before God's throne of mercy. God has everything to give, and we have nothing to give without him. We come before the Lord, as it says in, the, I believe it's the diary of the country priest, we come before the Lord with empty hands, with nothing to give. But only that which we have to give is that which God has given us. Only God has the power to bestow that kind of grace. And that's something maybe we should bring to the sacrament of penance. Very often we come to confession with our list of inadequacies, our list of sins. But do we ever come with something like, I don't pray enough. I don't spend adequate time with the Lord in prayer. How much time do you spend with the Lord in prayer in relation to everything else that you have going on in your life? Maybe balance that up against how much time you spend on social media. Social media, prayer. Probably social media. And spending more, much more time with our cell phones, looking at our phone or computer rather than with God, the one who truly wants to hear from you. Father Angelus used to say, our former superior when I first came here, 
He said, no activity in this world fulfills our reason for existence better than prayer. God made us to know him, to love him, and to serve him. Our praying teaches us to implement these activities as no other effort can because we pray to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says the three greatest consolations in this life is to be in union with God. The greatest consolation that we have is to be firmly convinced that these three persons, the Holy Trinity, are there for me and that they love me and that if we so choose, that God dwells within us through sanctifying grace. This is our greatest need, to be loved by God. Prayer is nothing else than exposure to God's love and his merciful gaze toward us. Very simply put, prayer is exposure to God who exposes his merciful gaze toward us. The tax collector in the parable teaches us the disposition we should have in prayer. When the Lord finds a truly humble person before him in prayer, God rushes to that person with his divine assistance, with his sustenance. That's the prayer that we should have on our lips, the prayer of the tax collector. Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So how was that? I think he did a really good job, don't you, about knowing God? And you can't know him if you're checking your phone all the time or if you're on social media. And of course, we all think we're so busy, we don't have time for God. But our, most of our time should be devoted to him in some way or another. Watching programs, reading books, reading the Bible, it all helps. So, God wants us to know him and, of course, be humble in all ways and all things. So again, now, let's prepare to see, receive Christ in the Eucharist. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. And we all say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy indeed, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the cup, and once more, giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, giving thanks that you helped us, <clears throat> that you held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray, that by partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember also our brothers and sisters and parents who have fallen asleep in the hope of your resurrection 
and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. So let us now recite the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Of course, we all say, for the, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So, Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who will live and reign forever and ever. Amen. So the peace of the Lord be with you always. And now we offer each other a sign of peace, a hug, a handshake, a kiss, whatever you're comfortable with. My sweetie pie Karen manning the cameras and production here. So I love you, sweetheart. Peace be with you. Now, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. And we all say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my, my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. <clears throat> now, folks, if you have your bread and wine or grape juice, please take a moment take communion with each other and uh, reflect on what God has done for us. So the body of Christ. blood of Christ. So, before I continue with the closing prayer, I want to do something, all right? As you notice, I'm wearing black. I know it's purple for Lent, but um, the fact that I just lost my dad a few weeks ago, my brother a few months ago, all right? I'm going to read something, something you've heard a lot, I'm sure. So, it's from the Gospel of St. John. And it's chapter 6, verses 51 to 58. All right. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. 
and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, unlike your ancestors who ate and still died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. I wanted to read that because it's going to be part of my dad's mass service. My dad was a Eucharistic minister until he was not able to do so. For my mom, who couldn't go to church, and a woman in his um, community who also was not able to and, and go to church. So he was a Eucharistic minister. And if you think about how many times in that passage about eating Jesus Christ's body and blood and how they are life. That's why we celebrate communion. The other thing that I was very, very honored to do last July, the last time I got to see my brother, and I didn't know it would be the last time, I truly didn't. He gave me such an honor because he asked Karen and I to, after we watched um, a service online from his um, son-in-law, Zoe, his church in Texas, we, um, he asked us, asked me to pray and for us to have communion together. It's unbelievable. I felt so honored. And yet, like I said, didn't know that would be the last time I'd be able to hug him and look into his eyes in person. And so communion was important to Jake too. Or he knew it was important to me. Either way, I just thank you, Jake. Thank you, Dad, for dedicating your some of your time to to feeding the bread and wine to others. Okay. So we're going to have um, our, our closing prayer, okay? And this too was at my mom's service, and it's going to be at my dad's service. And it's the prayer of St. Francis, okay? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you so very much, folks. Take care. God bless you.